Welcome to class, everybody. We have a special guest today, Mr. Doctor, Mr. Doctor, Reverend Mark Letiri. I don't have a degree. <laughs> well, I do. Yeah, Mark. I'm, okay, marketing. I have a BS and BS. I was a marketing major. Yeah, well, you know, I don't have a knowledting uh, degree. Yeah, but you have a master's in jazz guitar. He has a marketing degree because his name's Mark. Yep. Or, or something like that. Anyway, um, I've known Mark for. I don't know, 15 years or so. Yeah, it's been a while. And uh, 2010. I've seen I've seen Mark's career just blow up like a like a <laughs> like a zeppelin. Uh, <laughs> in flames like it a hasn't bird. yeah it hasn't been canceled yet. So nope. we'll, 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 you know we're happy to have him and um, and um, he's awesome and and uh, you know since this class is uh, dedicated to being creative with fundamentals and Mark, he's got a lot of fundamentals down, even though he didn't uh, go to music school. Uh, he's in a way he's, he's got, he's, yeah, he's, he's done his own music school. So anyway, uh, welcome hey, Mark was here. Which camera do I look into? There's only one oh. right there. Okay. Well, cool. Hey everyone. Um, let me sit, let me go on the other side here. Good to be here. Thanks, Noah. Um, yeah, I don't uh, have a plan for today because I don't um, don't really ever have a plan. <laughs> it's okay. But uh, I, have question, I have questions for Mark. Okay, questions are good, but I guess raise your hand if you're like, who the heck is this dork? It's totally okay if you don't know anything about me. <laughs> someone, someone. But somebody probably was like, I don't get it. Uh, but anyway, yeah. I'm a guitar player, composer, producer, songwriter, session musician, band member. Um, I played with Dave Chappelle the other day. That was really fun. Uh, we've, I've actually done quite a few gigs with him. He, he'll do these things where he uh, sets up shop at a, at a comedy place or a, or a club or something, and he'll do a set, stand up, and then have some musical entertainment. And uh, one of his best friends is a very talented harmonica player from France named... Frederic Yonet, and he's uh, one of the only harmonica players that plays a diatonic harmonica chromatically. So if you're familiar with like jazz harmonica, usually those players use a chromatic harmonica. Frederick uses the old school blues one, but he can play 12 notes on it. In between notes, how yeah. does he do that? I have Just no the, idea. the way he bends? I have no idea stuff? how he does it, yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, so Frederick does a lot of things with Dave, and Frederick uh, calls a lot of different players to come play his music. So we did two nights in Yellow Springs, Ohio, doing a lot of laughs and uh, some music. So, yeah, it's kind of cool to see where music will take you. But um, anyway, yeah, I, I got my guitar here. I got some pedals. We want to make noise with some pedals and or just crack wise I don't know okay I have a question so since this class is a fundamentals class I have a question for Mark that maybe he can uh, answer what are some okay. things that you consider to be fundamentals fundamentals probably the most important well I don't know the most important thing but time feel playing in time playing with solid rhythm um, I don't know who said this but I've heard it said by a couple different friends of mine is that everyone in the band is a drummer and uh, that's always been an important concept in my mind I like to make the joke it's like yeah if you're on the gig and the drummer spontaneously combusts into a, a green glo globule like in Spinal Tap you know you still have to be grooving all all by yourself and um, so I've always made that an important part of uh, not just practicing, but, you know, executing the stuff that I've practiced is making sure that the time is good, um, that I'm able to lock with, with different kinds of musicians, uh, understand how different musicians approach the beat. If they play ahead of the beat, if they play right on the beat, if they play a little bit behind the beat, um, and kind of be able to live in all three of those worlds necessarily but um time feel i think for me is probably the most important um time feel that's a good fundamental um 
And then just silly things like making sure your vibrato's in tune. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's a big pet peeve of mine is when I hear a guitar player vibrato and it's out of tune. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, All right. So time feel. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> How did you work on your time feel? I played along to a lot of records. Uh, I played along to a lot of records and just by nature of my life, I've played thousands and thousands of gigs um, with with all different kinds of players, but the last probably 10 years, 12, well, almost 20 years now at this point, uh, has been spent playing with really great drummers <laughs> um, and, and getting in a situation where uh, you're kind of forced up to a level of really great time feel. But I, I think I would have stuck out like a sore thumb if I hadn't practiced that at home, um, practiced to a lot of music that's groove-based. I'm a big, you know, funk and R&B head, but I also really like rock. Um, but I also really like rock rhythm guitar, um, not just rock lead guitar. Uh, but but even then, I think even some of my favorite rock soloists all had great time feel. And if you you can go on the internet now, and they have these those old Eddie Van Halen solos that are just the solo. They've stripped away the band, and he's still swinging. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, so I've always kind of kept that in my mind. But um, yeah, I, I, I practicing the records has always been kind of the most fun for me. In terms of practice and then you know if there's certain parts of the record that I, that I want to transcribe whether it be a phrase or a lick or riff or maybe an entire solo I, I'm not one of those players that's transcribed a lot of solos um, I don't know why not I just there's I mean there's a couple I can play I play in a, uh, a, a cover band sometimes called dad rock and we play a bunch of like early 80s AOR music like journey and Toto and stuff like that so some of those solos I can play note for note but um, only because I started doing this in the last <laughs> you know, year and a nice. half. <clears throat> but. All right, so when I first met Mark, we had um, this, this gig together where we hung out what, three days a week. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think I said, uh, like on the, one of the first times I heard you play, I said, you've checked out Wayne Krantz, haven't you? <laughs> yes, I have. And he said, Guilty, and at, at that t I I think at, for me Wayne Krantz was the first one that really stuck out to me as he plays like a drummer. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, I got I got into him in college, and I actually only own one Wayne Krantz record. Two drink minimum. I have two drink minimum, which I think you have to import from Japan. At least that's how I got it. Man. Yeah. I asked my dad for it for Christmas one year, not knowing that he was going to have to spend forty dollars on it. So thanks, Dad. Uh, but yeah, that record—it's trio. It's him and Lincoln Goins and Zach Danziger on all the tracks, or maybe yeah, I think all the tracks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that his his time feel and concept of of like really heavily rhythmic guitar solos, I thought was really cool. Um, so, so my time feel was definitely influenced a lot by him as a soloist, but, uh, and then, you know, all the great R&B guitar players, Paul Jackson Jr., Prince, you know, Ray Parker Jr., a lot of people with Jr. in their name, um, a lot of session players like Steve Lukather and Larry Carlton, and, um, you know, just players that just played stuff that felt great, you know, and even players that, like, their time is kind of, all over the place in a good way, you know, like Alan Holdsworth, who sort of plays over the bar line all the time. But that's just his sound. Big phrases. Big, yeah, big long phrases. Um, good. <clears throat> Another thing that Mark said that I that stuck with me is um, when you lock into what the drummer is doing, and you can kind of emulate your rhythm guitar part. Sure. By a drum part, and <clears throat> there's this really great app that. Um, I can recommend you get it's called drum genius drum genius all one word um looks like this um green alien dude i don't know what he has to do with the <laughs> gig but but there's all these different like um all these different styles of drum uh grooves and um i think it's sampled but it, it, the 
whoever programmed it did a really good job making them sound like real real drums and, nice. and so <clears throat> you can do um, you know all the classic drummers like I just um, looked at uh, I don't know funky drummer Clyde Stubblefield nice and um, so tell, tell me what tell me what you told me that, well I don't know if you remember what you told me but like it was something oh. about this, this part is a hi hat, this part yeah, is a kick totally, drum. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I, it, depending <clears throat> on the the type of rhythm that you're playing, or or even like the type of chord that you might be using. I mean, I, I'm a firm believer that any chord type or sound or whatever can be funky. It just depends on how you play it. I mean, you know, we're, you can play a, a fancy, pretty voicing like that. Hey, that's the one chord chord. Uh, the one, yeah, the Noel's. So, you know, you have all these kind of like expensive chords. So that's, that's an old Nashville term. I remember I was hanging out at a, at a buddy's studio in Nashville, and I, I think I picked up a guitar and, just, you know, I played this or something. And he goes, oh, you know all your $13 chords. $13 chords. $13. Cool. That's cool. Like, okay. Uh, odd number. But anyway, um, so, yeah, you could take an expensive chord, for example, this B-flat major 9. What technically is this? Got the 13 on the B flat D. major 13. Yeah, 13 yeah. yeah, okay. So we got a B flat major 13 chord. <laughs> Not a chord that you would ever see in a James Brown song, ever. Or you want to try it with this? Yeah, group? sure. So, oh, this is the test. This is the. Uh, so before, yeah, yeah. There, oh, nice. Okay, funky drummer. Second, I don't even know what this sounds like. But so, well, help, hold on. Don't. Yeah, I, I think I know exactly what it sounds like because I know the song. But what we're gonna do conceptually here is we're gonna take this 13 dollar chord. Uh, and and I'm gonna look at you can even just kind of look at the chord and be like well I'm playing something on the low E strings where my B flat is and then I have the money notes here at the top so really like this can if you're just thinking low to high this is your kick drum that's your snare and your hi hat so you can so you don't distinguish between snare and hi hat it's just the attitude of I'm sorry not sna uh, kick drum and hi hat yeah I mean your snare I, I always I always <clears throat> think rhythm guitar more like, or I should say like funk rhythm guitar, almost more like percussion rather than drum set. I mean they're all kind of oh, related. Okay, okay. You know, I mean you can live in both worlds, but um, a lot of what you end up doing is like shaker work or tambourine work, but on the guitar. But uh, for this sake, well, yeah. So this, so the, the top notes are going to be your shaker, your hi hat, your subdividing units, right? Pulse, right? Pulse subdivisions. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Now maybe the middle strings, D and G string, can be our snare drum. All right. So put on funky drummer. Oh, that's almost exactly that's what, that's what he was playing. Can you make it a little louder? All right. So here's our expensive chord. Two, one, two, three. You have a chord like that uh, you can you can think low to high the low stuff is your snare uh, your kick drum the higher stuff is your hi-hat your shaker and then the snare is sort of arbitrary <laughs> I think um, but now if I were to play let me play an actual funk chord on that you know think there's a little bit more real estate uh, with like a ninth chord you play that with your pinky that is interesting oh yeah I don't yeah, I don't know. It just depends on where my fingers fall. Sometimes I play it like this. Sometimes I play it like this. Oh. I don't know. I don't play it like this. 
with, with all four fingers. Well, yeah, you're missing a note, I guess. Right. <laughs> so if Noel plays the same, same beat, group, yeah. Depends on how you play it, but so I, I can just say that's a big reason why Mark is famous. <laughs> oh, I'm dead head. serious. His time is so good, and everybody loves Mark's time. Everybody loves Mark's time feel. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, buddy. Nobody <laughs> like yeah, like yeah. It's. So, yeah, it's but what he's, Noel he bought a house because of it, he can play like <laughs> that's okay. funny. Uh, but actually, what Noel did was amazing. I didn't know he was going to do that, but he turned the phone all the way off and then he turned the volume back on to see if I was still in time. I'm a jerk. No, that's good. I think I was. Yeah, it was perfect. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> but that's a great practice, and I'll, and I'll give you guys a nugget. Um, we talked about drum loops. We have drum loops. If anybody has that uh, soft that thing or um, Logic or Garage Band or sonar any of the DAWs that you can get on literally any uh, device nowadays this is a great great tool um, and a great thing to do and I've done this before uh, and it's it's really hard but what you can do is get your make a drum loop for yourself um, you can either grab one you know a loop pre-made loop I like to make my own drum loops um, I feel like that's actually really great practice too if you have like a MIDI keyboard or something and you actually can drag in the kick drum and the snare drum and the hi-hat and program it all yourself, that actually helps a lot because then you're essentially thinking like a drummer because you have to. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't feel like doing that right away, use the stock loop. And here's what you do. Get the stock loop, run it for 16 bars or something. Uh, come up with a groove that you can play consistently, like something like I was just playing with a ninth chord or, could, you know, whatever you can do that's consistent that you can repeat. Record yourself playing that groove over the drum loop. All right. You can put the click in if you want, but just do it with the drum loop. Okay. Then turn the drum loop off, turn the click on and play what you just recorded to the click and see how good your time and your feel is. Your time might be good, but if it feels rigid, then it ain't there. It might feel okay, but if your time is wonky wonky, then it's definitely not there. Then you can do it the opposite way, where you record the same thing to the click by itself, and then play, you know, play to the click, turn the click off, and then put the drum loop in and see if you're grooving to the drums that weren't there when you were recording. So I did this when I was, uh, I, I did a loop package with Apple computer um, about two years ago where the whole premise of it was like 250 Mark Letiri guitar loops. And so they had to feel good to a click because I didn't know what people were gonna be using these things for. They could put them in an over any drum pattern. And with Logic, you can stretch the tempo and all that kind of stuff, but I didn't know what drum pattern these customers were gonna be using, so it had to feel good to a click. So when I was writing these things, you know, one part would have been like, or say that, right? I would record that to what I thought would be a potential drum beat that somebody might use. 
turn it off, and then see if it felt good to the click. And if it felt good to the click, it was good. Then move on to the next thing. You can get those in GarageBand, right? You can get them in GarageBand. You can get them in Logic, <clears throat> whatever. Um, but it's great practice, and I think you know utilizing a technology that's pretty readily available. Uh, but you know, in in studio work, and and Noel can tell you. Um, you know, being able to play to a click is very important. Uh, my kryptonite is solo acoustic guitar at a slow tempo to a click, <laughs> which I, I hope I hope I'm not the only guitar player that feels like his pants are on fire when he has to do that. But slow. you know what I mean, like gospel ballad where all it is is vocals, a click, and a scratch piano that may or may not be with the click. <laughs> all right, so. <clears throat> I have, a, I have a very technical question. So okay. I noticed that, and I, and I subscribe to this method too, keeping a consistent right hand mm. with the subdivisions. Like if you're doing 16th notes, all the, the downbeats are with the downstroke and the ands are also with the downstroke. The es and the uhs mm -hmm. are with an upstroke, mm -hmm. one e and a. Uh. Uh, how much thought? Uh, not not much gotcha um but I, you're doing it yeah I mean, i'm just, doing yeah, it yeah. yeah i think the um i think for me it's all about the pattern and the part and then my right hand sort of just follows what the intent is so like you know yeah if i'm playing uh a nice kind of 16th thing like uh one So I've, I've already made up in my mind that it's going to be like one, two, three, four, chang a lang a lang a lang lang a lang right? So I'm, I'm hearing it sort of uh, more actually like if I were to sing it or rap it with my mouth <laughs> before uh, I play it on guitar. Like if you guys check out any of that amazing Indian conical stuff or like, I mean, that's way from another, you know, country. spectrum. Yes, <laughs> also country. <laughs> Uh, or any of like African uh, chanting where they chant with the drums and it's like a call and response thing. They're singing all the rhythms, you know. Uh, so if you can sing the rhythms, I think it, it actually helps you internalize them. So, so in my mind, I'm thinking, no, 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 you know, like whatever syllable you want to. And it's just automatic. And it, and it sort of becomes automatic. Yeah, but um, another thing I'll do is, is like if it's a consistent kind of 16th, rhythm with some breaks, like those are, there's a couple rests there. Where it was just those upstrokes. So, da 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 I'll keep my right hand going over those ghost notes, so you get the string scratch, and that's totally fine. Um, now you can practice it without and totally stop and not play the ghost notes. case I'm just doing two upstrokes or you can keep your keep those uh, chicken scratches in there and another thing to think about is I'm swinging these 16th notes so there's an implied triplet in there right there it is so so uh, I'm thinking about that. Well, I'm not thinking about that. I'm feeling that. Um, so I check it out. I can swing the triplets. Can you do your gorilla drum chest beat thing while I do What did he, what did he, what did he, what did he do? It's fast, right? One, two, three, four. Cool. So swung now you can play the same phrase but straighten out the 16th notes and that's going to go like this one two three four so hey, 
do it again. I'll okay. do the straight one again. All right. One, two, three, four. Okay, now, now do the swan. Two, three, four. Okay. I have something to show you guys. All right. There's a physical aspect to what he's doing. Okay. <clears throat> Explain so, away, sir. So I want you to see this. So tell me if you notice what's going on here. Okay, yeah. One, two. This three. is straight first. So, anyone, uh, anyone see uh, what's going on here? So, yeah, yeah, you can see the swing in his hand, in the right hand. Well, there's a there is a very specific thing I'm looking at. So imagine the pendulum on a clock, right? And if the pendulum is exactly the same distance, say say, say this is the click, okay? If it's exactly the same distance swinging either way, like the center is the, is here, it's going to be straight. Mm. Okay? But imagine the pendulum like this. You're still in this, right? But now the, the point of contact is swung, right? So I noticed that when he was doing swung, your hand was going a little lower. The, the, the point, the middle point was yeah. like further yeah. north, like on the tiny strings. On the tiny strings, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, um, I'm, and I'm actually even thinking about uh, kind of what Noel's point is, is that the tiny strings, like, opening up the chord like this rather than straight across all the strings. You know what I'm saying? So, like, when you're playing it straight, like an arc, you can kind of just power through the whole chord, where if you're swinging it, you can sort of, like, a little bit, on the low strings and there's a slight dip and then the high strings have a little bit more act. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like a, by having your hand drop a little bit lower, it allows you to get behind the beat a little bit more versus playing yeah. straight. Because well, that's what I've always noticed is if you play straight, you're going to like kind of keep your hand right there. But when you're swinging it, you get more of a wrist action because you want that extra like fall behind the beat kind of feel. Well, I think, yes, and I think uh, if that's the intent, sure. You can swing and totally be dead nuts on the beat, um, but it is easier to, as you were saying, kind of kind of lay back a little bit with the swing because I think that triplet exists in sort of a floatier kind of uh, register, you know, as opposed to straight where, yeah, it, it's, it definitely feels a little bit more machine-like, I think. Like, if you ever heard i have this band called the fearless flyers and if, you know if we're all playing 16th notes uh we're all dead with nate's hi-hat pretty much um but then we have other tunes where that are a little more swung and i'll just screw around and lay far behind everybody just to be cheeky <laughs> uh but nate usually catches it so it's pretty great um but you know any of that kind of here's a fun story anybody watch the documentary well that's what i'm talking about the interview with charlie hunter on the vertex channel where he's talking about playing guitar on the voodoo album the d'angelo voodoo album not all of it but a little bit yes well all right long story short charlie hunter is one of my favorite guitar players of all time he plays a now he plays a six string guitar but he used to play an eight string guitar that was half bass half guitar and so he's capable of playing bass lines and guitar parts at the same time he can do it now on his six string it's just a different tuning but anyway he was hired to come play on D'Angelo's Voodoo album, which is a landmark R&B soul, neo soul, if you want to use that word record. And uh, he was, it was him and Questlove in the studio and, and uh, D'Angelo, and, and they laid down the tracks. And afterwards, uh, when the record came out, a friend called Charlie Hunter and was like, hey man, they really messed up your stuff. And he was like, what are you talking about? And when he finally listened to it, he realized that they had kind of like slid the parts back in Pro Tools to make it swing even harder than they actually physically <laughs> were able to play it. Uh, and I think it's so funny because obviously the results were incredible and now everyone plays like that naturally. 
uh, because they heard they were just like, oh, I guess this is how we're supposed to Dylan, play now. Dylan, 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 yeah, Dylan, no, no, no. Um, D'Angelo produced it. I think Raphael Sadiq produced some stuff too, and um, Mike Ele- uh So was he trying to? Russ um, Russell Elevato was the engineer on that one. Yeah, was Dylan doing stuff um, similar to that um, before, after that? Or I can't really speak on that. I think it was sort of around <laughs> the same time. But the thing about Jay Dilla is that he would play all of his um, drum machine parts live to the loops, the samples that he created, which is why the time is not perfect on those things. Oh. But it also is why it feels really cool. Yeah. Um, and those old MPCs, or those Akai MPCs, had a swing function. That uh, so any of that old old Dilla stuff, but also like the early uh, Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre West Coast stuff. If you really listen to that, it swings way harder than a lot of current hip hop. And I think, uh, it, well, first of all, it was coming from a funk influence, but also I think the technology at the time had this. They had this swing function on the Akai MPC that they they don't have anymore. Yeah, but anyway, um, I, yeah. That that sort of leaning way behind the beat sort of stuff is is you're right. It's a swing feel that's uh, implied by manipulating your triplets basically. But the funny thing is, is that none of those guys are thinking about that when they play it. <laughs> you, I remember you telling me about uh, Charlie Hunter saying he played it dead on, dead on because he's an he, Oakland I mean, they, guy. Like yeah, I mean they <clears throat> yeah they yeah he's a you know Oakland Tower Power guy but uh and they leaned back as far as they possibly could uh but then d'angelo was like no not enough <laughs> not <laughs> enough and he, wow. you know took the kick drum and whatever else uh i figured you know why don't you just press play on the cd player just a little bit later that's right and everyone's later yeah or leave the cassette out in the sun for <laughs> a couple of days <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah that's interesting so all right so you mentioned Tower Power. Mm-hmm. That would be a good band to check out. Yeah. And work on your funk stuff. Sure. Uh, James Brown. Yeah. Okay. So is it Catfish Collins playing guitar? guitar yeah. Power? And, um, guitar uh, yeah. Bootsy's brother, um, Jimmy Chank Nolan was the other guy. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I think a lot of it was those fellas. Um, but yeah, J- James Brown stuff is always great. Um, Earth, Wind, and Fire. There's Al McKay is on guitar there. Um, Steely Dan's got some great rhythm guitar parts, you know. Um, uh, I, the, for me, a lot of the kind of like golden age studio rhythm guitar was like late '70s, early '80s. Um, so that was a lot of Ray Parker Paul Jr. Jackson, Jr. Yeah, Paul Jackson Jr. Is, uh, was on a load of records. Um, there's so much out there, you know. I mean. One of one of my favorite guitar records is is Thriller <laughs> by Michael Jackson. Not just because Eddie Van Halen played on solo, but uh, on beat it, but but just the rest of the guitar parts on you know like PYT is awesome. Uh, let me play it. What was my oh, what was the problem with volume pedals? Like you know. <laughs> Triads, all that, yeah, triads. triads. Yeah, I mean, but the majority of of, of pop R and B rhythm <clears throat> guitars is tiny chords, as I like to call them, uh, but a lot of triads, and and that's because those chords you can make them funky a lot easier than you can bigger voicings or voicings that exist on the lower strings, uh, and they just work well in large ensembles. You know, I mean, Snarky Puppy, for example, like I play a lot of tiny chords. In that band, because there's 42 people in that band. <laughs> so, so, all right. So, let's. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time on triads because I feel like those are good fundamentals. How much study have you done? Like, did you ever do like a systematic study of triads, or no. you just learned parts? I just learned parts and 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 uh, just sort of self discovery. You know, just silly stuff like, oh, a D is also the top of a D minor if I just move it up <laughs> two fret. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're all, yeah. And then like, oh, I can go, and it sounds cool and bluesy and funky. <laughs> and it's all just because I learned D. 
<laughs> okay. You know, yeah, I mean, pretty, pretty garage bandy, just like, oh, this is cool, this is cool. There may have been a, at a time in my studies where I did do that. I just don't remember doing it, you know. Um, I probably did. I, I took a year of jazz guitar at TCU, and we did work on voicings. I remember we, we did. But uh, it was more like jazz chord voicings. So I kind of knew a lot of those, but just like... Jazz chord to say I love you? Yes. But uh, that was weird. <laughs> you know that <laughs> but, joke? You guys know that joke? <laughs> No. Uh, you guys go, anyway, sorry. But, you know, so, but that was more like, you know, you're sort of like uh, chords like this and these sort of shapes and stuff like that. So, so not necessarily. Well, I see, you play the, the, the Phrygian chord. Look at that. that one, but. See? It's cool. It's very cool. I use that chord all the time. Hey, question for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, do you remember when I gave you a bunch of voicings that I've written out? I think so. Okay. I, I didn't mean to toot my own horn, but I was just curious, like, um, did you learn any voicings from your friend Noel? Yes, I did. I think this one was actually from you. This one, or well, yeah. These, all these ones. Where's the... That, yeah. So I did learn some cool Phrygian. I, I wasn't really like big into the melodic minor sound till I started hanging out with him and now I play it all the time. So, thanks. Yeah. That might have been a, you explained to me when I was taking jazz lessons, but you know, I was in college so I had my head and other things. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like but, math? No. And science? <laughs> Just like, I don't know, <laughs> rock and roll yeah. or whatever. But um <clears throat> yeah, I mean, a lot of that triad stuff was just like, uh, yeah, fi parts, learning parts, you know, um, like I'm like, you know, like up the Prince, this triad, a minor 13 chord, a minor seven chord, put them together. I mean, it's the, that's, that's Minneapolis. <laughs> do it again, do it again. Or in C. Okay, so he's 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 thinking of this as the anchor. Yeah, we're in yeah. C minor. So he's not playing the C. Yeah. He's letting the bass player do that. Correct. So, exactly. And then I realized you could play the same sounding thing down here. for like four or eight bars yeah and then my mind wanders <laughs> no um but you know for you if you're jamming with your friend you can kind of do that because then he'll play something different if i change things up or whatever but um I, the, you know the definition of jazz musician is someone who never plays the same thing once <laughs> that's awesome so, <laughs> i like the one that was like a jazz musician plays three chords or three thousand chords in front of three people and a rock musician plays three chords in front of 3,000 people. I try to be somewhere in the middle. You know, 28 chords in front of 600 people. Dude, that's a <laughs> lot. Something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of those tries, and even, you know, I think I've talked about this in some of my lessons, but like, if you're good with your scales, you can just make, just find your own triads. Just be like, okay, I know the C major scale up and down the neck, then, you know, just start grabbing your shit. Whatever, all that stuff is in the key of C major. <laughs> all right, so how did you work on your scales? I learned those. I had a great teacher in high school um, named Gordon Kahn. You met Gordon. Yeah, yeah, Gordon's cool. Yeah, he's great. 
And he was a student of Joe Satriani's back in the 80s. And I, growing up, I was a huge Joe Satriani fan. I was like, I want to know how to do the legato. I want to know what the modes are. And that's how I learned music theory was because of my interest in Satriani. And so Gordon was like, well, dude, if you're going to even attempt this shit, you need to know the modes, dude. And so, so I got real into the modes and modal playing and things like that, or at least the modes of the major scale. But a big part of those lessons was learning scales uh, up and down the neck rather than in the box form, you know? So, so taking a C and playing it this way, or it as far up as you can go. And an easy way to do it is just like, you can even pick, start at one string at a time, find the lowest note in the scale. So if we're in the key of C, the lowest note in C major is E, right? So you can, there you go. You can do it on your low E string. shit <laughs> looks I skipped that right all the way up and down the neck on each string starting with the lowest available note in the scale and it, you'll start seeing the patterns go this way because I know maybe I don't know who's in the class but if you started guitar and you got kind of come from a pentatonic rock background right you've got your like well I can play a here and I can play my box here you got your two boxes right well there's all these notes in between <laughs> You know, and, and, and so if you start learning your scales this way, you won't get lost when you're playing your phrases because it'll start connecting the boxes that you've already probably checked out, you know. Um, what, plus, plus, you got all that extra finesse you can do where you slide. Yeah, the you cool can do the, yeah. the, 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 legato, the legato stuff, the slides, you know, the tapping, whatever, whatever technique you want. But. But for me, it was more about not getting lost on the fretboard. That was like my biggest fear as a young improviser would be, was being like, you know, well, I have my two boxes that I can play in. So let's give them an example. Oh, so I'll, right. I'll, I'll play like a, a C major chord, right? Okay. This guy. God dang it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, pick a string. Okay. Uh, D. And then just go up and down the D string. Make make up. He's gonna make you know, make up your own solo. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Something like that. Ready? Go. Of C major chord. I thought he was going to do this. Dude, I wasn't playing the fourth. I wasn't, I That's right. You didn't play a fourth, so I could do what I want. Totally. Lydian sounded cooler than fourths are tough in music. Do you guys talk about this? Like, if you end a solo on a fourth, ah, it's the worst sound in the world. Yeah. You know, you got to be real careful. Fourths to me are, are like either you're going to be real clustery or you got to pass right through that song. Okay, how about this one? Still on the D string? Sure. Oh, it doesn't matter. forces you to, to try to well forces you to figure out where the notes are but for me it kind of makes me play in less of a guitar way because I can't do guitar things you know what I mean but, but it makes guitar cool it makes guitar cool yeah because I'm not th I'm thinking like all right well I can't bend oh I can bend but I can't like what can I do I'm stuck with one string so I'm thinking rhythmically at this point you know yeah but but the, the, all the finesse stuff. stuff you're doing like I, I feel like that's like <laughs> it gives like other instruments guitar envy. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So. All this, all the stuff we can do that other other instruments can't. You know, like um, the slides. You know, yeah. Like the, uh, yeah, I, I kind of well. It's not about me, but I, as a jazz, when I was in jazz school, like. When 
when I first started, I, I felt like guitar was sort of like the, the redheaded stepchild of the, of the group, you know, mm. like the, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, um, it's like the, there's piano and there's horns. Like th those are the kings of, of mm. jazz. And like, like guitar was sort of this like inferior horn and <laughs> inferior piano bastardized into one instrument. You know, like as, as a guitar player, I sort of had this inferiority complex mm. as a jazz as a jazz student, but, mm. but like it's all that stuff that made me realize I said, wait a minute, guitar is actually better than those things it, that like piano can't do that. That's true. Horns can't do that. Like, if, if there was ever a, like a sax player that would do this, you know, you know, like right. they're, they're trying to be us. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, that's the running joke. It's like in Snarky Puppy, the horn players, all everybody wants to be guitar players, and the guitar players want to be keyboard players. <laughs> or something, you know. But yeah, all the horn guys are using pedals now and all this bullshit. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, but yeah, man. And I, I saw this, uh, you know, the, the Masterclass series. Mm -hmm. um, this is one thing that Herbie was doing. He was playing this, like, lick, you know, something like, I can't remember what lick he was playing, but something like, uh, you know, something like a uh, guitar lick. You know, well, yeah. Oh, sorry, that sounds terrible. But... Mm. There's a, you know, right. which is a, you know, the piano can do that, that gliss thing, you know. Right. But, but he said, he says, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to pretend like I'm bending notes like a guitar player, and I was like, wait a minute. You're pretending, you know, you want to be us? Like, oh, you man. may want to be you. you well, know? I, you guys ever listen to any of that Jeff Beck stuff they did with Jan Hammer? It's kind of like, who's influencing who, you know? I mean, I I, I wonder if, if Jan got that from Jeff or if Jeff got that from Jan or whatever it was. But but those records are like Bibles to me. They're like Wired and Blow by Blow and all that. Finesse. Finesse. Yeah. So. Finesse thing. Okay, so. Cool. Another question. Actually, I forgot what I was Okay, I'm not I'm not as good as they have any much. questions. Yeah, hey, sorry. Could I jump in? Could I ask a question? James. Hi, James. Hey, how's it going? Um, I I wanted to ask you like, what's your relationship with like, I don't know, vocabulary for lack of a better word. Like, I guess what I'm thinking is like learning licks and, and saving them, putting them in the bank, like, play, and then playing them later when you're at a show or whatever. Oh, nice. Um. Like, do you do you find yourself doing that a lot? Are you, when you learn licks, are you doing them like verbatim, or are you just kind of taking the idea? Um, do you have licks that you think sound like you, that you kind of you know, because you definitely have like a signature sound for guitar. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I yeah, I think both both things you said. There are some licks that I seem to be able to play the same way every time, and I catch myself. When I do that, I'm like, oh crap! I already used that one. You know, I, I still got 50 more minutes of, of set to play. You know? <laughs> uh, but but then a lot of times it's stuff that just has just gets repurposed on the fly. You know, I, there's no problem with with practicing licks. I mean, I think it is at a certain point it's 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 okay to have a little, some like uh, little, some little anchor points in your improv that you can go back to, but. Um, one thing you can do is if you catch yourself playing a lick, you know, if you know you're going to play it again, try to do something different with it, you know, change the rhythm around slightly or maybe one of the notes or something and just kind of break out of that pattern. But um, what you don't want your improv to sound like is a series of licks with a bunch of filler in between. Does that make sense? It's like lick and then um. Lick and what, uh, <laughs> where can I go until I can play the next thing that I've practiced a hundred times, right? You don't want to get to that place. If you get to that place, you, you need to somehow get away from it. <laughs> or, or, or practice your filler. Or practice the filler. <laughs> and as soon as you find yourself playing a lick, you know, stop. Um, but, but yeah, and, and that's totally natural. Man, everybody's going to have licks. I mean, every great instrumentalist has licks. I mean, I think that's probably what defines you know how many times is how many times did jeff beck do that in his career <laughs> a million but who cares because it was awesome right you're like that's jeff you know um so or you know whatever 
Petrucci thing or whatever. It, you know, uh, so licks are fine. Just just don't find yourself relying on them because you're confused otherwise. <laughs> okay, so yeah, practice practice the filler stuff is what I would say. So would you say that your discipline as a composer hmm. has helped you work on that filler? Yes, yes, because if you're making records, writing music, and you're using those licks a lot, well, that stuff's recorded forever. <laughs> <laughs> for all times and if every solo you played on your record has the same you know seven or eight licks in it you know that's you don't necessarily want to make that statement so um i would actually yeah Noel make makes a great point uh writing music to me at least in the last 10 15 years of my life has been my practice um writing tunes that's uh, pretty much what this class is well good right i, I mean we're I'm, working on like, like when we were working on the major triads, like, okay, guys, write a tune that forces you to master these triads or whatever. Sweet. Yeah, yeah I, I think composing, writing, whatever fancy word you want to call it, uh, is the best way to develop your sound and, and to just find out what's interesting to you. You know, because there are so, so much, so many different ways to play the guitar. There's so many temptations out there of like the new thing that you think you... You know, because it's on Instagram or something, you feel like you need to know how to do it. Um, but, but really, I, the writing is really great. And I don't care. You don't have to write an album, man. Write a riff, write a solo, write a chord progression. Just produce something creatively that didn't exist before you picked up the guitar. And the more you do that, the the more I think your 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 technical practice will be focused because you'll start focusing on the stuff that you really want to know because it's the stuff that's going to help you make the music you want to make, right? Because that's really what we're all doing. Is where you know, I know this might be a fun hobby or something, but it's an art. It's a tool for art. So don't be afraid, even if nobody hears the songs. I don't care. All right. But, question. Okay. On that point. Okay. So, is there a certain thing, compositionally, or like a certain sound? That you are exploring right now that you're working on? Dang. Well, hmm. That's a really good question, and I should have been prepared for that. I just finished recording another album. It's 12 songs. Um, and I, I think I challenged myself a little bit more with chord progressions to solo over. Um, of course, I can't remember any of them to play for you now that's usually how new records go is you write and record them and you're like shit what <laughs> now i gotta learn it <laughs> now i gotta what did i do uh but but i i, str I challenged myself to, to to play over some changes that i hadn't had in any of my records before and that they're not you know it's not we're not talking giant steps here people but any harmonic minor modes i don't think there's any harmonic minor any modes. melodic minor modes probably okay uh but harmonic major no hungarian minor <laughs> no <laughs> hungarian goulash are more like it <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but you know, so that was, a, that was a bit of a stretch, but, but I'm also, you know, being really, what I am working on is, is, is production, okay. you know, arranging these tunes, arranging the guitar parts, the keyboard parts, you know, producing the people that are playing on it so that it works. Um, because, you know, as guitar players, we have a tendency to, especially if you do instrumental guitar music, you have a tendency to like just overdo it all the time. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to be more conscious to not do that. Um, and, um, yeah, th I think that's where, what I'm, what I'm really practicing on and, and the sound that I'm trying to get is, is from a production standpoint, I think. Um, hmm. can I ask a question? Oh. Uh, it kind of related to what you were saying yeah. when you were, hi, um, hi, uh, thanks for being here. It's super awesome. Um, when you are working, uh, soloing over, changes and uh for me it's any changes but you new changes how is there a way that you could kind of keep track of where you're at or where the chords are and then still kind of be in the flow when i get in the flow i tend to lose track of where i'm at totally. and then i'm just sort of like uh liquid mercury just floating about then i'm like i don't know where i'm at in the progression though yeah well to, i mean for me it, it's just repetition 
you know, if you if you have an opportunity to play over those changes as many times until you just internalize them. This guy's a master at finding the cheat codes for a lot of changes. So he sees four chords and he's like, well, I can just use this over all four chords. Any any shortcuts like that you can find is great. Um, because one, it's it's you can make great music with it, and two, it's sort of a failsafe in case you <laughs> are getting lost, uh, or 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 maybe not feeling like you have to approach every chord like it's its own key center. Because maybe it's not. Maybe they all fall under, you know, one umbrella, for example. But uh, I, I definitely definitely repetition. Like with these with this record that I I did, you know, I I had the luxury of doing all the guitars in my house, <laughs> so. I sat there with these chords and I'm like, these are super badass. I don't want to play over them, but I'm going to sit here until I do. <laughs> and then, and then that's how you do it. So. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, but you know, if you're, if you're on a gig and you have to pull up a chart and there's some changes, then that's why he's here to help <laughs> find the shortcuts for that kind of stuff. But, but it's the same deal, you know, look at the chords and if you know their relationship to one another, um, you know, you go by the seat of your pants, but uh, most musical situations, I think that most of us will find ourselves in, you, you probably have a chance to maybe practice stuff ahead of time. So, yeah. Uh, I have a quick follow up question, which is the dumber question. Um, no such thing. <laughs> when you, I mean, you'll be laying down a groove for a long time and your pick doesn't seem to slip or move out of the way or go flying. Are you using like a heavy pick with a light grip or how do you like uh, yeah. keep it in place? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I use a, a, a Dunlop one millimeter. And I don't hold it all that hard. I think that's a big problem with guitar players who are who are starting rhythm guitar is they're just they're choking the crap out of this thing and there's no finesse in there. And yeah, your hand gets tired. Hmm. You're 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 it's th like this muscle in here gets tired, you know, because you're gripping the pick. Um, but also, but it sounds like you're hitting hard. Um, At least, like like you, it has a spank the way you're. you're I mean, doing. a lot of that's just kind of like. Um, I don't, uh, let's see, maybe it's So maybe guitar. you just use grip it for the ac certain accents. I grip it for, yeah, I mean, it's, you can tighten up and loosen it depending on the, on the flavor of the groove that you're playing, right? Um, and a lot of it's just kind of knowing where on the guitar to play, knowing mm. what pickup, I mean, we're all playing electric guitar, you know, knowing what pickup is going to do what when you play a certain type of riff, um, you know, really learning the, the guts of your instrument first I think too but um but also like I keep a pretty loose wrist you know mm. not, I'm not Corey Wong in it but uh but I'm I'm sort yeah right I sort of live kind of around around here now I never play from here I'm never doing this. Mm. I'm ne you know I'm never in a situation where I'm sometimes maybe if I'm sitting for a while I start to do this and that's not good but but with but funk rhythm guitar, if you're playing for a long time, you watch those guys like the old school guys, and they're just chilling. Mm. No, there's it's they're not working hard, you know. And so um, as soon as you find yourself working, feels like a weird st strain, you gotta lighten up. Uh, but okay. for, yeah, but for one, I think it's definitely don't don't over grip your pick because then you're just gonna sweat more, right. <laughs> and then you are gonna lose. I, I have a, I have a technical fault. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So play, play you guys. Your, your oh, sweet, man. sweet spot. Like he's like Troy. Like, he's like Troy Grady. I know. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like okay. All right. What should I play? Look. Something cool. James Brown is fun. Okay. Okay. Stop. Yeah. Okay. So your your sweet spot is right there, like just in front of the. Middle pickup. Yeah. So it's about. So you go, you go back when you want some more. So here's spank. the deal. Yeah. So so this is what I'm talking about learning your instrument. So I'm right take now. A measurement. I'm okay. gonna take a measurement. Dude, I'm super super nervous. <laughs> no, this is great. Okay, get out of the way. Uh, get, get out of the way. All right. So it's about what? Four and a half inches. Five inches. Where are you Wait, trying to measure? I don't know. Like what? Where's the thing? Okay, so um, you guys pay for this? Yeah. <laughs> four, four seven five. All right. Okay. Around at the B string. Okay. It's at the B string. It's four seven five. Now. Okay. Play this. Play that guitar. Okay. 
the pick there. Oh. What's the volume difference between these two guitars? Because this this one's plugged oh, straight into the, the computer. This is less. It's four and a quarter. Yeah, because this is further this way. Interesting. Probably. So, right? So you're doing it based on the comfort of your arm. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, yeah, there's like a uh, certain guitar. Actually, this guitar, the Fiore, what, the very first edition of it, everything was pushed this way. By I like remember a, you saying that. A couple millimeters. Oh, was, I thought it was the opposite. No, it was this way. Really? And I could feel it. And I, I remember saying to Paul, I was like, hey, you know, it was hurting your arm or something. Well, it wasn't really hurting. It was like, just felt, everything felt longer this way. And it was a mental thing. And 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 uh, and, and I would just wasn't used to it. And I said, what's the deal? And, and he was like, yeah, it's not the same as a Strat. And I was like, we'll make it the same as a Strat. So, he, <laughs> so we just, yeah, so everything goes this way. So now at life, you were to put it on top of a fender, it would line up exactly so the there's, same way. So there, there was more girth here before? No, I think that it was just... This was yeah, you mean I'm talking about in the wood? The, the distance uh, between yeah, the, I'd have to get between that and the bridge was a little bit. Or the neck cut was different. I, I'll bring an old Fiore over huh. next time and we'll stick them on top of each other. But but yeah, those type of things, you know. So it's important to have a guitar that's comfortable to play too. I mean, and I could play Tellys all day long. I, I love yeah. them, but um, you know, <clears throat> generally, I mean, yeah, I usually live around in here. You know the weirdest and one? And then if I'm doing some single note things that I want muted, I just move back to the... The, 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 the weirdest one yeah, those in that regard is, is, the, is the Firebird. But I also like to play back right by the bridge for single note stuff, you know. And get that nice twang. So explore the, the whole range and, and find out where the tones are that you want and then... You know, the, you hopefully you'll figure out a comfortable way to find them. That's so a weird just, guitar. I don't like that guitar. You don't? No. Man. Okay. So yeah, everything like they sound it's cool. So but weird. Like, it's like I feel like everything is like shifted over like ten frets. This is goofball. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. Look at this, people. <laughs> All right. Yeah. See, now it's like here. Plus, it's right, out of tune. Right off the bat, my trapezius is not in a place that I would want it. I would not want to play this guitar sitting down for a long time. I'm sorry. So, but yeah, it's weird. It's just standing up. It's totally different. Classical position, maybe. No, they're, they're, they're. I mean, it's more comfortable for me. But anyway, is that your real signature? <laughs> yes, it's the best one I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> All the other ones look like Smash Mosquito. Uh, but I have a I have a question, kind of like injunction of that like in the same thing go for it uh so i have uh I, i've always liked strats but i've noticed that like if i don't have so one of my favorite strats was stolen for me um and that was really sad and um but uh, i got this one is an exotic uh, but even this i uh i picked this one it was because of the pickups does it I think for me, it affects the way I play rhythm, like how spanky the pickups are or not. Um, I have a different guitar here in the back that I could probably play later, but like, I I feel like my rhythm always changed with like how low gain it is. So like the way I aff it affects the way I hit that. Yeah. Like, you know, like something like that. Like, you know, like I think that to me, it matters a lot to like not be like, I mean, you could, but like, I think for me, this is like the, like having that kind of sound, like, does that affect you too? Like, do you think about your tone where you do it or like how you do it with the groove like stuff that you do? Like how hot the guitar is? Yeah, I feel like I've always had trouble. Like I play a lot of church gigs. I've seen you, by the way, we've met like a few times. I went to a few of your gigs here. Hey, um, you I'm in the Bay Area, so. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. So, um, but anyhow, um, I've always noticed that I, I feel like I change the way I play 
every time my guitar doesn't sound as clean as this, this is not even as clean as I'd like it to be. I would like it to be lower gain than this, but it is the best that I could, uh, that I like. Uh, the ones that I like was Fibonacci, the El Nico five pickups, but I mean, I'm talking tech, but like, it's not about that, it's just the playing, but I think that it affects the way I play. Does that happen to you? Yeah, I mean, that's natural, um, especially if something's louder or hotter or more responsive than you're used to, it, it, uh, it can mess with your dynamics. Um, one thing that I have messed with a lot is just the height of the pickups. I mean, it's in, 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 I, in, there's something Paul was telling me when we were designing this, you know, I, I forget what it is, but you actually like lose quite a, a bit of DB just by lowering them a fraction of a centimeter. You know, it makes a big difference. Um, so there's always that, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess to answer your question, I do sometimes play differently depending on what kind of guitar, I mean, like I play a little bit differently on a Tele than I do on a Strat or a Fiora or whatever versus a Les Paul. Um, cause sometimes, you know, those guitars just have a sound and you want to get that sound, but still kind of sound like yourself. You know, I've always just found that at the end of the day, the most expressive I am is on a SSH guitar. That's just how I get my point across, but there you go. Yeah. Um, but I love tellies. I love, I mean, this guitar actually does the telly thing. It does, well, you know, kind of, it does these two pickups at the same time, but, um, what was I going to say? Uh, you know, and I have a 335 or a Collings 335 that I play that makes me sort of I get into my 70s session guy helmet when I play that guitar and I just think that I'm Larry Carlton or something, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I think as long as you're not, the most, the most important thing is you're not fighting with the guitar from a setup perspective, you know. I mean, like electronics can be sort of tweaked or you can kind of live with it, but like if the, if the guitar is just not set up properly, it's, you're just not going to have a good time playing it, so, you know. I try to avoid setup is a big deal. I'd rather have a killer guitar and a shitty amp <laughs> than like a shitty setup guitar and a super awesome two rock or something. You know. Yeah. Well, that's one of the other things. Is I bought a two rock and I plugged this into a two rock and then, oh, then you the two rock sounds. You've won music, man. Just get yourself a class. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I'm in this class and you're teaching this. So yeah. <laughs> Well, no, I'm I'm really grateful, but um, I I was really hoping that that would kind of like solve some of the things because I got like the, it's not it's not a hot uh, amp at all. Now I also have like this uh, California Tweed Boogie, which I love, but um, yeah, since that guitar was stolen, it I never found the same guitar that kind of sounds the same. So like, I'm just trying to convince myself that it's not it's not that it's just me. So, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but it's true, man. I yeah. mean. You know, some guitars just sound a certain way and there's nothing you can do about it. And it's one of those magical spiritual moments that it's either going to be great or not. And, you know, I have guitars that I've put in 42 different pickups in it, What you know, whatever. And it's just it's just the way it is. I don't know what it is. Uh, and so sometimes that's when you, you're like, honey, I need to get another guitar. But um, anyway, <laughs> call you. Oh, anyway, th thank you for that. For that oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, sure, man. So you didn't buy that uh, 59, uh, 175? Oh, wait, it's a 55. 55? Yeah, was it 170, wanted, 175? I think it was. Man. They wanted uh, 14 grand for it. Damn. So, no, that's not, not what I do. <laughs> I'm not a vintage guitar guy. I'm not. Not, not that nobody cares, but I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Can I ask a question? I have a question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Fire away. Oh, okay. Going back to the writing process and stuff, what, what's it like writing with the flyers? <laughs> uh, it's pretty easy. Um, like this last record, uh, I came in with four songs. Um, Corey came in with one or two. I'm sorry. I came in with three songs. Corey came in with two that we then ended up co-writing on. And then Nate came in with one that... Uh, we kind of all ended up co-writing on. So um, it just so happened that we just record whatever we had. <laughs> and uh, um, and you guys record at Corey's studio or? No, we recorded it live at the uh, Blue Note in New York. Oh, nice. 
couple couple of days. We re- we rehearsed them one afternoon and just kind of got the you know, and I had the tunes that I brought in. I had kind of written parts for everybody, and then they you know turned it into their own thing. And um, Corey's tunes, he I wrote the melodies for him, or some of them. It's kind of collaborative, but um, everyone just kind of brings in ideas. Some of them are totally finished, others are sort of halfway there, uh, and then we just go for there. We try anything, you know. I mean, and and but but uh, you know, with that music, I think this record is probably has the most harmonic stuff on it, the most chord changes <laughs> out of any Flyers record, <laughs> and it's not that deep. But compared to what we were doing, it's Steely Dan, you know. <laughs> so. Uh, but we kind of wanted to do that, you know, have a couple little extra things, but, um, you know, it's fun to write for that band and it's actually kind of challenging cause you want it to like, you want it to be interesting, but it can't be too heady, you know, uh, and, cause there's only four of us and that's fine, but we don't have a keyboard. Uh, you know, we don't have horns. Um, there's only so much I feel comfortable playing on a baritone guitar. You know, because if I play baritone, I, it, I definitely play a little bit differently than I do on a regular guitar, because um, that instrument dictates a certain kind of sound. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm comfortable with it. But uh, you know, so we so we try to fit this aesthetic of like these kind of micro funk tunes. Um, but this this record, we kind of opened it up a little bit, added a little bit more chordal stuff, I guess. But you know, still not. Still not rocket science, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a fun band to write for for sure. Cool, thanks, man. Yeah, I have a question about sound. Sure. Um, there's a tune called "Spark and Echo" off the album entitled "Spark and Echo." You're with me I so know far. That one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, you make a you make like an air horn sound, like a wonk wonk wonk. How did you achieve that air horn sound? It's like two fifty eight mark two fifty. 259 is like a air wow. horn. Do you remember what I'm talking about? You make that sound throughout the throughout the piece of it. Uh, so, let me look. Let me look. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll play them. Is it in the melody? Yeah, it's in the melody. 258, 259, Spark and Echo. All right, let's see. <laughs> Farther on, farther oh. on. All right, Noel's gonna watch it. 259, all right. 258, 259. Oh, that? It's 243, 245. Oh, that, 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 that. Oh, that? Yeah, keep going, yeah. keep going. <laughs> That? The slide? The slide? The Steve Vai thing? Yeah, oh. yeah. It's really pronounced at 258, 259. It's like really, really like. That thing? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a Steve Vai, probably a Steve Vai track. That's the, the, you know, the finesse thing we were talking about. The stuff that... <laughs> you know what? No, there is... Yeah, that, 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 that was, you know, this, I always joke when I were about to play the song, I was like, this song is the Flying Unicorn Guitar God song or whatever, you know. Not Guitar God, but, but uh, yeah, I, all the drama. <laughs> But but that's all it is, man. Um, I think it's over a B flat. Um, so it's on the G string, and you're sliding down a whole step from D to C. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, two, two, three, one, two, three, you know, pew, pew, pew. So it's an eighth note. Pew, pew. It's an eighth note. That's all it is. But um, I think to get that sort of like it's, you have to kind of like almost pretend that the first note's not gonna ring out that long. So you're almost sliding it before it even gets a chance to breathe. Yeah. So like the D, so it's not, it's, so you're almost sliding the note like 
it's like running away from the pig, like, ah, catch me if you can, I'm already at sea. <laughs> Does that make sense? He left. Is he on mute? Uh, he's probably on mute. Okay. Does that make sense? Just give me a thumbs up. Yes, yes, yes. It's good. There he is. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So that's all that is, man, I think. But I probably got that from Vi. Just like I got this one. <laughs> so silly. That's awesome. That's a good front row I was trick. just thinking, like, if, it, if you wanted to, like, if someone wanted to invent an exercise to get really good at that pion pion lick, you know? You could practice your scales like that. Oh, Imagine shit. like a B goes. flat major, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty sick. Something like that. You know, you could get really good at it. And uh, I was just reminded when you said Larry Carlton, like he has an extra, he he has this really interesting systematic method for if you want to work on your bends in tune just mm. play scales where you're you know, bending it yeah you know, bending yeah. each note Sound. I like that. Air horn. I think about that every time I play that song now. <laughs> air horn and finkel. Finkel and air horn. Yeah. Cool. Um, what's this? Andrew raised his hand. Oh, I'm with it. Um, just to get in your head a little bit, could you name maybe you know one or more? solos that you listen to like 500 times and can't get enough of like you know That's over, a good the last, Man. over the last 20 years or whatever um i'm the one uh sure. yeah van halen's i'm the one or girl gone bad girl gone bad is maniacal and just the thing that he just did that ah man but that's a great one um what else? Girl gone bad. Is that on Van Halen too? It's on it? 84. 84, 84. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Anyway, um, but yeah, that one's great. Uh, what else? Um, I probably listened to Kid Charlemagne a hundred times. It's one of those solos where I'll learn it and then never have a chance to play it and then forget it, <laughs> which is always a bummer. Um, probably the, um, I listened to, recently I listened to the Running With a Night, the, um, the Steve Lugather did on uh, Lionel Richie. That's a great solo. Um, the one he played on Talk, Talk To You Later by The Tubes is another really cool one that I've been checking out a lot. Um, but like probably the one that I listened to the most as a kid was probably like free bird <laughs> or something like that. But, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of like a cool, uh, that'd be a cool Jeff Beck one. I, don't know, I mean, cousins and his lovers, but also goodbye pork pie hat. I love his take on that one. That's really cool. One, one thing that struck me about Mark when I first, oh, met him. sorry. Okay. Who knows by the band of gypsies, Jimi Hendrix. When they recorded it live in Berkeley, the Berkeley or the film, one of the film New Year's Eve gig or something. Yeah, the New Year's Eve. That's a great solo. What were you saying? So, I one one thing I noticed about Mark is like, so Mark's what about ten years younger than me, but he he knows like everything from my generation and <laughs> and beyond. You know, like he he's just really checked out a lot of music, and um, so he. I would say he's a, this a, is a, 90, a 90s kid, you know? When you were in high school, it was like the grunge band, right? Is this love? <laughs> That's Noel's favorite band. Wait. White White Snake something, oh, right? Is it? I yeah. Um, I think John Sykes, his vibrato <laughs> is like the greatest vibrato. Like whenever <laughs> it's I... It's pretty amazing. Whenever I touch that Les Paul, it's like I want to become John Sykes. Mm. 
You know. Yeah. Um, which I've never met John Sykes at, but you know. Neither have I. Um, anyway, he's amazing. I love John Sykes. Anyway, um, so yeah, I feel like he knows, like he's just checked out a lot of music. He knows, like he's an encyclopedia of stuff that was popular, you know, post, <laughs> you know, probably the Beatles and on. Maybe. Some uh, stuff. Yeah. Um, except for, I did get him, like I played, I played <laughs> this, stuff, stuff, stuff that people my age would All right. know like crazy. Let's like see if I can still sound. Stuff that is just not, there's certain... It's a TV theme. That's why oh, he doesn't know it. Uh, a team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got him on that. He's well, he not does, this time. Nobody check. Nobody listens to TV themes, you know. But you can check out music from the '80s. It's like, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, no. That was my. That was my show when I was. All right. How about this one? Has the Has the Phrygian chord. Post, Mike dude, Post. Mike Post, man, great. He wrote uh, all that good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That's anyway, awesome. you know the, the the guy who played guitar and all that stuff. Um, well, Carlton did a lot of that. Carlton did a lot of it, but there's this one guy. Dang it, I'm forgetting his name now. Um, well, the guy that did uh, Steve Watson. Steve oh, okay. Watson. He has a really good guitar school in South Carolina, and a lot of these kids like are coming up. Like freshmen, you know, they go to a lot of them went to USC, a lot of them went to UNT. I mean, a lot of it's like they can really play. Like they they're shredding Donna Lee, like like you know, three hundred beats a minute. And I'm like, where'd you go to school? I was like, oh, I went to you know, I studied with Steve Watson at whatever wow. guitar right. school. You know, anyway, he he moved to South Carolina. Anyway, did he? Steve After. Watson. Yeah. Did you know the guy that wrote the? Uh, <laughs> He like wrote, sang, and played guitar on that. So his SAG Afro checks are yeah. very big. What's his name? Don't remember. Okay. But he knows. Yeah. <laughs> he sees it on a check. Yeah. <laughs> his wife knows. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So um, yeah, that, that's the thing. Like Mark, Mark has checked out a lot of music, and I think one of the things, excuse me, one of the things that made makes him valuable as an asset. Uh, in the studio or as a sideman, not just his incredible time feel, but his knowledge of like almost every guitar, popular guitar style that has ever been done and recorded for the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 <laughs> years. So when someone says, oh, I'm thinking of this thing, he knows exactly what to do. He knows exactly what sound to get, what technique to do, what, you know, whatever. So um, anyway, I, I, it, Thanks. Musically wise beyond his years. Like <laughs> even though he's you know, he's not young. Old enough now to you know to drive. But yeah, but <laughs> but when I met him, you know, he was just a kid, you know, like Yeah, well. And and I was like, dude, you know a lot of music. Well, I think I mean, you know, we all I, I I've always just been excited by great guitar parts. Didn't really matter the genre, even if it was something that I knew I had no interest in learning how to play. I still enjoyed hearing it and, and understood that it was important to a whole lot of people that I should probably at least have it as some kind of a reference, you know. And I think that makes, uh, yeah, if you if you do this professionally or you just like playing music, I mean, it's always good to have a an open ear because you never know what's actually going to influence you, you know. So anyway, anybody else got anything while we're here? Um, yeah, can I ask another? Uh, I was wondering. Um, what was that? What do you consider? I know you do a lot of studio stuff. Um, what do you think about like when you're trying to find a part for a song, and especially like when your first instinct isn't working like you thought it would? Because, like, I don't know, I had something happen to me like that, and I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. Um, 
So I guess, yeah, that and also, I mean, similar thing. What do you do when you're trying to find a direction for a solo? And you're, you know, same thing. First instinct isn't happening. What do you think about to find it? I love that question. Do you want to answer I, it? No, well, no, no. I, I want to deepen his question. I don't know if he's okay. asking that, but like, James, if, if you get an idea for a part and someone says, hey, can you do this? And you, you come up with an idea for a part. And they say, oh, I don't like that. Or I want something different. It's, are you saying it's, for, for me, it's like, it's very hard to unwind, like to, to erase what you, mm -hmm. what's already in your brain yeah. to come up with something and without taking it personally. You know, it's like, um, I, I, I guess that's the rule. You, you sort of can't take it personally. It's just producing. It's not, you're a terrible person. <laughs> right. I'm like, I'm the same. I guess I try to like, find a variation of what I initially tried that'll work a little better. Cause like, like you said, it's hard to get out of the mode that you're in already in that situation. I would definitely like, you, I guess like do, do two things. Like step one is you under you, something inside of you is saying that it's not working Two, find out why three, figure out if you can change any of those things and have the part still feel comfortable for you to play. Uh, and if not, you know, step four, um, ask someone to tell you what to play. Hopefully you're working with a producer that if they, if they also know that it's not a good idea, can offer some kind of suggestion. Even if it's some totally off the wall thing, it's like, ah, it sounds like cinder blocks. I need it to sound like butterflies. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, More but, green. but, you know, and, and if you're, if there is nobody else in there that's giving you any direction, uh, then, then, well, then you, you probably have the luxury of trying a lot of things because you're not on anybody else's dollar. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I would try, I would find out why it's not working. And if there's something in there that you can change to keep it uh, familiar to you, then change that and see if it works. But if it totally doesn't work, then, um, then yeah, I would just start, I mean, there's no harm in asking. I mean, a, a producer is not gonna be like, what, I gotta tell you what to play? It's like, that's what producers do <laughs> half the time, you know. Uh, I have people sing me parts all the time or they'll hum it or, I mean, heck, if it gets down to it, they'll get on a keyboard and play something, you know. Um, but as Noel was saying, like, it's not an ego thing. And, and you know, sometimes things take a while to get. Um, and And, you know, it's not just because your first instinct wasn't good this one time. I think it's how you react to that. I think if it's like, if you're not up there trying to force an idea that you're so convinced is going to work, you know, um, that sometimes can create friction because the producer's just like, dude, it's, I know you're trying to do this, but we don't need you to try to do this anymore. <laughs> we need you to just do this other thing that we're going to come up with for you. Um, you don't want it to get to that point. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, I would say first try to try to fix it. So it's still within the realm of what you originally conceived and then just start kind of taking the layers away after that, you know, cause, cause the minute you start forcing something, it makes the session about you and not about the artist that's asked you to be there. And that's where stuff gets a little wonky. I made the mistake once again. Don't worry about it. We all do. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. I've also like, I don't know. I've fixed stuff. I just remembered this. I've fixed parts for myself, like when I'm at home recording, just by um, simplifying it a lot. Yeah. That that's usually a, a good Isn't a good fit. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I know the feeling there, my friend. Do you uh, encounter a lot of like extreme uh, politics in the in the music scene in California? Uh, well, I don't live there anymore. Um, and and when I was living there, I wasn't old enough to. I didn't have a career. I was I was a teenager. Um, but uh, you know, po po you talking about like politics in the music business, like like government politics, or just like both like it just like extreme personalities oh well i've met all kinds of people <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I've met all kinds of people all over the world that have had all kinds of opinions. And most of the time I just say, that's awesome, man. Can I come buy you a beer? Nice. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and you just, you know, smile and nod or find some common ground. You know, I, I, I would probably say the, a, a big part of my job is, is hanging out, talking to people. You know, I go out to the merch thing after every gig and talk to every single person that comes up there. And, you know, some people want to give you their life story about whatever, and that's great. And, you know, but it might <laughs> come from a place that you don't agree with or something, but, you know, they bought a ticket to the show, so I will have a cordial conversation with you, and you can buy a T-shirt, and I'll see you in the next gig. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I work with people of all kinds. So that's just part of it. Part of it is just being flexible and, and, uh, and, and mature and, and um, just having a good attitude. You know, I mean, God forbid you're on a tour that you hate, where ever, nobody's getting along and fine. Then you just do it. You don't ever go on that tour ever again with those people. But, um, you know, it's uh, – thankfully, I've, ne I've never really been in a position where my morals have been compromised. <laughs> there was maybe once or twice, and I just said no. I just turned the gig down before it even happened. And the Dallas Observer wrote about it for some reason. But <laughs> that's another story for another class. Uh, but, you know, yeah, part of the, part of the business is just, is just being cool and being flexible and knowing that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be way different than you. And you just, you just go with it. So, you buy him a beer. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, well... Thank you, Mark, for being here. Thanks, Noel. What are we doing? Yeah. That was awkward. All right. <laughs> I was going to do this. Okay, we'll shake my hands. My favorite like, handshake. Like, you do this. You just keep it. Just, 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 it's a touch. Yeah. I'll just pat him. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, you guys. Uh, Thursday, I'm doing my one of my box shows, so there will be no class this Thursday. I'll send everyone an email reminder, but um, I'm sorry to miss. So I, I've been I've been doing the I've been putting chords putting chords to this stuff. You want to check? You want to see this? Crap! Wow! So it's like. It's it's a little bit nuts. Okay, so um, anyway, um, so I'll see y'all next Monday, and um, thanks again, Mark. For being thanks, here. guys. Yeah, yeah, this was fun. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. All right. See ya. Thank you. Cool, man.